Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm super excited to introduce to you today Dr. Lisa Hightow Weidman from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, Dr. Weidman Hightow, Dr. Hightow Weidman. Um, she received her medical degree from the University of Virginia School of Medicine. She did a residency at Stanford University. She received her master's degree in public health and epidemiology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she is currently an associate professor um, at the University of North Carolina Healing School of Global Public Health in the Department of Public Behavior and School of Medicine. And School of Public Health. And School yes. Of Public Health. Okay. Um, most of Lisa's work is in um, HIV prevention and HIV, addressing HIV care continuum. The majority of her work is with um, trans women and race and MS gender, MSM, yeah. sexual orientation minority populations. Um, and this year, she won the HIV MA Award from the Infectious Disease Society of America. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hightow Weidman. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, this is a, um, I was excited to, to come. I went, I, Lisa invited me, and uh, I think she was surprised I said yes. So I was like, oh, why are you surprised? I would love to come up there. Um, so uh, I know, you know, she was like, really? I was like, why did you invite me if you didn't think I would come? You know, I felt like I wasn't sure if she really actually wanted me. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've known Lisa for a few years, you know, um, and our paths cross um, a fair amount with, I think, some of the populations we work with and some of our, our focus of sort of our interventions in terms of, of addressing stigma, um, prep uptake, engagement in care um, and things like that. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of our work um, and but really sort of focus on um, I think sort of what I've learned in terms of doing mobile technology um, based interventions over um, over the last few years I would say um, maybe 10, 15 uh, when you start going through the CVs and there's more and it's like oh goodness. Um, so I've been at UNC uh, about 18 years now, so it's, it's added up. Um, all right, so the groups that I focus on, is, as, as Lisa mentioned, um, are um, young MSM, particularly young MSM of color. Um, and I think, you know, the reasons that I'm focusing on sort of this group is, are, are clear in terms of sort of HIV prevention um, and treatment. So again, we know that, um, that, that HIV, uh, uh, that young people make up a, a fair amount of those that are diagnosed with HIV. Um, we know that, um, that many still don't know their status. So despite you know, availability and our, our use of um, a lot of different novel ways to engage folks in testing, youth are still um, you know, under-tested in terms of other, other populations. Um, again, we know that the group most impacted by HIV um, continues to be young black MSM. Um, and then again, I think we know that then when we start looking at even you know, PrEP, um, the groups that need it, need, needs it most are the ones that are less likely to use it. So we've seen a lot of increase in PrEP uptake over the, the last few years, which is lovely, um, but it's a, most of it is being driven by 35-year-old white MSM in San Francisco. So, um, and again, I love, I'm originally from, yeah, I'm from San Francisco, I love it, you know, don't get me wrong, but, you know, it's not being driven by, you know, 24-year-old black MSM in North Carolina. All right, so what about technology? All right, so, you know, I look around, I think most of you have your phones out in front of you. Um, they all look like smartphones. Anybody have a flip phone here? Anybody not? Does anybody, has anybody not sent a text today or some sort of instant message, right? Um, and a lot of you are much, much younger than Lisa. So, um, so um, I'm going to say, um, so, you know, they're pervasive. Youth, youth, I mean, technology is pervasive. You know, youth are certainly sort of the, the you know, a, a driver, but it's pervasive, right? You know, we, we all sort of use it. Um, and it's sort of our daily diet. And, you know, I was talking to some folks this morning about, you know, kind of, you know, when you think about your phone and your, and, you know, what do you do every day on your phone, right? What apps do you go to every day on your phone? Um, and then think about, you know, when we think about mobile technologies for, for engaging youth or really any population, you, know, you put yourself in their shoes and think, what would make you use a different app that you're using every day, you know, happen, 
right? Um, and I think then, you know, you can start to kind of start to think about kind of what are youth using every day? And again, I think social media is the key. Um, and we were just talking earlier about recruitment. Facebook is not as cool anymore, right? Because, you know, again, Lisa's on it. She, you know, um, you know, older populations, right? Posting pictures of their dogs and their children doing wonderful things, right? If I'm a young person, like, I don't, I don't really care, right? Um, and so, like, my daughter who's eight has an Instagram account. Now, granted, it's blocked, and if you work for me, you have to sign up for it and follow her and like her stuff, and nobody else can. Um, but you know, she, you know, she does, she wouldn't do Facebook, Instagram or TikTok or, you know, um, you know, Snapchat or, um, you know, all, all these other ones, right, that, that we have to obviously kind of keep, um, keep abreast of. So why do we use, um, we sort of putting it all together, HIV, M Health, and youth? And again, it's because they're technologies that can offer a lot of cool features. They can offer features to engage folks. They can offer ways to um, provide real-time support. Again, if you have an in-person intervention, that person is there during that time period and that time period only. If you have an intervention that's mobile, that intervention is potentially available to that person 24-7 because their phones are typically with them 24-7. So it provides these opportunities. It doesn't mean that it always fulfills them. And we'll talk about how to make it better uh, or higher likelihood of fulfillment. Um, and I think we've made a lot of progress. There's been a lot of work. You know, again, everybody wants to make an app. Everybody's going to build an app, you know. Um, I think if you submit a grant today and you tell me that, you know, you're going to build an app in the innovation section, I'm going to give you a very bad score because I actually think it's less innovative to create your own app now. And it's more innovative to actually build on what we know and, and do versus sort of creating from scratch. So I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of work, but we now need to think about how to do things differently and better and um, at, a, at a larger scale and a more sort of um, looking more at effectiveness rather than just sort of these, these little studies that we've been doing. So what are the keys to sort of effect, you know, efficacious, does it work, and then effective sort of, you know, can we kind of get it out there and really have folks use it? Um, I think, you know, again, you know, make sure that folks, users, are, are involved from the beginning to the end and then back to the beginning and in the middle. Um, and so that, you know, again, make sure it's something that they would really use. Again, you know, in the, in a, in the world outside of HIV and outside of research, um, you know, iPhone, you know, people, like the features on iPhones are things that, like they know people want and they're going to use. That's why they build them, right? But they don't spend, you know, four years of an NIH grant, you know, evaluating one component of their intervention, right? Of their of their new i of their new iPhone. So something might not work, you know. That wasn't a great feature. That microphone jack. Again, I don't think that was the best idea, you know, to have that spare. It was like iPhone seven or something, right? But like, it didn't take them, you know, seven years of funding from from an R twenty one to an R thirty four to an R O one plus multiple rejections to figure that out. So I think you know we we also have to think about different ways to start thinking about how we're going to get this feedback in a more um, streamlined way. The more like the way, you know, Google does, right? Um, and so what do we already know about users? I think, the, you know, the first key point I'd say is, is SMS-based um, interventions, text-based interventions, um, they work, they're feasible, they're acceptable. But, you know, I, I don't, I can't see why you would test another one again, right? <laughs> I think we know they should, in my mind, I think they should be standard of care. You know, we, we, they're, they're easy to implement. Everyone sends text. We do it, you know, again, within clinics. Um, to remind, I just got a message today as I was with Lisa that my, apparently my daughter is, doesn't, hasn't had a dental appointment in a while. Um, you know, so I got that text. I'm guessing she didn't research that and do a randomized controlled study between, you know, some folks in her practice and others to see who set scheduled appointments. They just do it. It's a system that they do. So I think, you know, we, we need to think about kind of what, what is sort of standard of care, um, you know, in, in terms of what our, what our, our, our patients or our um, participants might be experiencing. Um, and then again, I think we should also think about if we're going to include them as part of interventions, what do we know? Well, again, for, these are mainly based on adherence studies, which is where I focus a lot on art adherence. Um, that we know that daily texts in that case weren't helpful, uh, weren't as helpful as more weekly. Again, people get annoyed. Like if that dentist keeps sending me messages every day, I will probably call Jessica Bishop up and tell her, like, stop. Um, or, you know, figure out a way that she'll give me a discount uh, on her services. And, um, but, you know, again, you know, she sends it. I think, you know, I think I got one a couple weeks ago, but ignored it. <laughs> so it's probably smarter for her to send it again. Um, those that had bi-direction. So if she would have said, like, 
if, it, you know, in the text message she just sent, it was like, call this number to schedule an appointment. And so I, did I call? No, I didn't call. No, I didn't call. So I'm sorry, Stella. Um, but if it would have said, click here and schedule an appointment right now in a calendar, I probably would have done it. Because I have my phone, which has my calendar. And I like, you know, or some like, you know, or, you know, have a start having a text conversation with the, with the provider, uh, that, you know, to schedule it. So bi-directional um, and again, personalization, you know, it did refer to my daughter, Stella, if it would have reminded me that she's had two cavities and she's only eight. And if I don't bring her back in, it could be disastrous for her future. Um, you know, that might have also made it more engaging for me. Um, the other thing is you're know, thinking about kind of um, other formats for delivery. So again, you all have sent at least one instant message or text today, right? How many have you have sent like a GIF or, um, you know, some sort of image um, or a meme or anything like that? Anybody? Was it funny? Did you think it was funny? Yeah. So emojis. No, no, only the two of you sent sent gifts today. I sent one. It's a really funny one about this cat that cut its own. Oh, it's like a monkey and it cut its own bangs. It's pretty funny. Um, did it with bangs? Throwing a laptop off of a table. Right, and <laughs> and that was today because this is how you felt this morning after our meeting. Awesome. Basically, <laughs> yeah. nice. Right, fair enough. All right, but consider these, right? You know, there's all kinds of ways to kind of like you know think about engaging folks rather than you know. Hey, have you tested for HIV recently? You know, again, this is how folks communicate with each other, right? You can say a lot with a cool, you know, a cool um, a meme or, um, or GIF. All right. Um, the other things that we know is that there's been a lot of work looking at youth preferences in terms of M health interventions. So what we know, again, we know that there needs to be, you know, or there, there are folks want, right? A lot of times people say what they want, but then when you give it to them, they actually, maybe they don't actually want it. But again, you know, they still say they want it, so you know, we sort of include it. But connections to peers, connections to providers. Again, a way to schedule appointments, a way to let somebody know that they're out of medications that doesn't involve them making a call. Um, inclusion of re discrete reminders, right? Again, nobody wants uh, a text message that, that says, you know, you are late for your HIV appointment. But people want their reminders. So how do you make them discrete? How do you make them kind of useful? Um, comprehensive, holistic, accurate information. Again. All day, all the time, I think about HIV, right? How to prevent HIV, how to get folks who have HIV to live chron you know, uh, long-term healthy lives. This is not what any of the folks that I'm like working with or for think of every day. And so if I prevent, provide them an HIV app that literally only has HIV information on it, it is no good to them. They, you know, it, 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 it's good to them for like a tiny little piece of time, right? They're gonna read one little article on it or whatever and then they're done. So if you want, if you, and that may be fine, right? If you're, if you're creating an intervention that is discreetly about increasing their HIV knowledge of a newly diagnosed person in that moment, that's fine. But if you're trying to create something that you actually want them to use and incorporate into their kind of overall life, then it needs to be much more complete and include some, you know, dish, information that's changing, updating, some connection to kind of what folks are doing. Because most people don't go on the internet and Google something, like, an, you know, even if they have a question about HIV, they may Google it, right? But then the next thing that they're doing is watching YouTube videos, right? Um, and then the next thing they're doing is they're on social media. They're not sitting on WebMD for 14 hours reading every article there is written about HIV. I mean, I don't think, right? You are. Lee says. Yeah. I'll send you one of the apps. All right. Games, rewards, incentives, you know, it, if you're, if you're going to make something, you know, there's certainly data that, that sort of making it more engaging is more fun. And, and we see that in all kinds, again, the business world, right? So, um, you know, frequent flyer miles are the, like, a perfect example, right? Like, the whole idea of, like, I am literally flying on a non-direct flight home tonight specifically because I'm trying to get my miles to get to Platinum. Next. Like, like, I'm, like, that's craziness. Like, I'm going to Atlanta first. What the hell was I thinking? Like, I probably won't get home tonight. But I'm going to frickin' be platinum, right? Which will get me nothing other than, I, you know, every now and again get an upgrade when I fly Raleigh to DC, which is about a 37-minute flight. Yeah, but hey, you know, 
It's about levels and rewards, right? Um, and then privacy and confidentiality. So the caveat is that a lot of this work is, really has been focused on older adults. So I think when I tell you kind of all the things we've learned, I think that the issues are likely different for as we get younger and younger because smartphone ownership is different, smartphone restrictions. Um, you know, again, I have like a, I don't know if you have, you probably don't because your children are probably well behaved, but I have, I have to, I had to get an app on my phone that like basically controls internet use in my house so that I can monitor it. I can just basically, like at night, sometimes if I'm trying to get my kids' attention for dinner, and I'm like, I give them like, hey, five minute warning for dinner. You know, hey, dinner now, and they don't come. You know, then I just turn the internet off, and then all of a sudden they appear, like, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I just do it just for fun, just to see, and then I count how long you know, it takes them. This is the middle of a game. I had 42 kills. I know. Um, so again, I think you know issues are are, are different, right, for younger folks. Um, agile development is a word we use often with with N M Health. What does it mean? Well, I think in in the research world, it means absolutely nothing. Um, but we say it, and it looks good in grants. So just you know that. But you know, agile development really means agile. Like you make changes as we go. We do th You know, we and and the way you s typically at least funding works with grants is like you get a certain amount. Which is not very much, and you have you give it to in your development company, and the development company with that contract says all the things that they're willing to do. So then, if you want to do more, they're like, oh, that's not in our scope of work, um, or the times, you know, the time. So we get we do some formative work, we get feedback, and then we go to them. We say we want to make these changes, and so okay, within that scope of work, they'll make these changes. But then, um, as we do more testing, we find more stuff. Well, they've already done that sprint and they've already kind of created the changes we've, we've, we've priced out. So I think we, um, we have to just think about how can we do better in the research setting with this concept because I think this concept is really important. This concept, this concept takes into account the fact that um, we learn things as we go. We can, you know, there should be no reason why, you know, we have to you know, keep each intervention exactly the same um, and not, um, and not make changes if we think we can make changes that will make it better. That's sort of the whole beauty of these types of interventions. So, you know, I think we just have to think differently about fidelity, right? There are other, um, uh, there are other you know, different intervention type um, uh, designs, right? Um, I always call it like Seabiscuit, but I think it's like the, the, um, the Seabit, you know, there, there's, there's certain evaluations where you can continue to sort of make changes and then, cont and then evaluate, right? Um, there are different smart, you know, um, designs where you can escalate or de-escalate folks within interventions based on kind of how they use it. So I just think, you know, again, we need to just sort of, if we're going to kind of use kind of what users tell us, think about how we actually will incorporate those changes into whatever we have. So what about engagement over time? So I think the key things, and we'll talk about um, these, is that, you know, you're limited in, in your M Health intervention by folks not using it. And, you know, if somebody is in an in-person intervention and they show up, we've always measured that as attendance, right, that they're there. Now, they could be there the whole time on their phone, right? They could actually be zoning out. They could be high, you know, like somebody in the back right there might be, you know, high and, like, totally thinking about whatever they're doing. But, like, I'd be like, oh, look at, I look at all these people that came, right? Um, and so, you know, but, but with M-Health interventions, we actually – monitor how much they use. We can actually follow them, you know, in the back end and kind of see they use their intervention for X minutes on X days, blah, 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 blah. Um, and what we know is then when we actually start to do that, that folks kind of aren't using them as much as, as maybe we want to, right? Or they fall off over time. Um, but I think what we've also learned is that we don't actually necessarily know how long we want people to use our interventions for when it comes to M health, right? If you think about it, the most, you know, the most successful in-person HIV prevention interventions are, you know, how many sessions? Six, eight sessions of one hour each? I don't know, making that up. But I, don't, I, I, haven't, I haven't looked at the Ebbies in a while. But I'm going to say that somewhere around that. So that's six hours of intervention time. And yet we want to make an app that people use for six months, and we kind of think, oh, they should be using it every day. Every day for six months? Right? It's not a fair comparison, I think, in some ways, to think about it that way. So we need to do better about thinking about kind of what we mean by engagement, how much engagement we think 
in this intervention they need to see behavior change. And then here are the key considerations, and I'll talk about each one. These are some of the things we know based on, again, work that's been done, not just in HIV, but in other health behavior uh, or you know, conditions that um, require some health behavior change that foster engagement. So tailoring. Um, again, tailoring just makes things more relevant to the individual, and people like that. People like to feel like they're providing you with information that is getting, uh, allowing them to get information that is relevant to them in return. Again, it, it makes sense, right? Um, you know, if I fill out a, a, some sort of survey, like on BuzzFeed, um, perhaps, no, but if I fill out some survey and, um, you know, and, and it sort of says, like, you know, what, what do you want to sort of learn most about or what are you most interested in? Um, and I say travel and food, right? And then, you know, it sends me, you know, um, some, some articles on, um, you know, soccer, like, uh, you know, or, you know, sort of a list, and, and, you know, and, or even just sort of some indiscriminate list, right, that has some articles on, in food, has some articles on cooking, has some articles on wine, but then also has just as many articles on soccer and um, video games, whatever, then basically I'm thinking to myself, why the F did I fill out that survey? They're just sending me the same thing. Like, what was the point? However, if I fill that out and then they send me, you know, a, 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 res a link to a recipe from, of a, you know, of some sort of meal and then how it pairs with wine and then, you know, where I could best travel to, like, eat that meal, you know, whatever. I'm like, what the hell? Like, cool, right? It's, it makes it you more likely to give it information to then, you know, um, get more information in return. So I think that's sort of the way, you know, I, th I think about sort of tailoring is, is that, you know, again, I, I'm all about myself, clearly. So I, I relate it to myself. Again, you know, would I do this? But if we're asking folks to use our interventions and they work this way, in, you know, would I do this? Would I be, like, pleased with this type of, of result? Um, and at least that's where my starting point. Then I actually talk to the target population because our opinions may not be the same. But at least for sort of a baseline, like, is this, does this have some sort of value added? Um, a law, you know, versus just literally Googling in the internet a question. Um, again, and we know this, you know, evidence, you know, uh, is always important, but that tailoring does show kind of greater engagement and maintenance. Theory. Again, um, you know, I've always sort of been in the belief of this sort of like the theory of whatever works, um, but apparently there's something to theory. Um, and I think, you know, the, um, the, the, idea, you know, of, of theory is that, again, there have been, you know, many, many um, studies and, and research that has gone into sort of understanding why people make decisions, why people, you know, do certain behaviors or don't do certain behaviors, why those behaviors are maintained over time or not. And there are certain, you know, theories um, that, um, that support how to help folks kind of achieve healthier lifestyles or change the behaviors you want. Now, I don't believe that there is one right theory for everything, and I think sometimes we get a little stuck in those, you know, buckets of, oh, I'm going to use this IMB theory and information motivation behavior, and that's, you know, and, and we get stuck in sort of this idea of, of sort of it has to be this because this is what was published. I think that there are new things that we've learned since some of these theories have been sort of developed. Um, you know, one example we were talking about was around social support, which is in some of, like, sort of the theories and sort of how that can build self-efficacy. Those theories were created when social support was really determined by who you had in your immediate network locally. It was not based on social networks on the internet and how they may or may not impact skill building or self-efficacy or support. So I take things with a grain of salt. But I think always sort of understanding why you think something is going to impact behavior change is important. And then ensuring if you're going to build an intervention that is going to address that intervention or that behavior change, that you're um, not only having components that address this sort of the theoretical uh, mechanism, but that you're going to measure that at the end. Again, we talked about this fostering social support. Again, you know, we, we know that the Internet can do this. We also know that it can take it away. Uh -huh. um, and so we've seen kind of the pros and the cons of sort of social networks and how they can lead to, you know, in some cases, suicide, right, which is, you know, not a good ending. Um, and so, you know, providing, you know, social support as well as um, negative reinforcement um, is really is something that, you know, to think about 
But I think, you know, we can certainly, if we're going to create interventions that we're um, monitoring, that we're building this support in, then we have, I think, more control over kind of what the messages, at least, that are being provided. Game-based elements, this to me is sort of, you know, fun um, because, you know, it's, it's game-based elements, right? So, you know, virtual rewards, there's a whole lingo, um, points, badges, levels, leaderboards. There's, there's you know, a, a lot of work with very sophisticated thoughts of sort of what gamification is. In my simple mind, it's when you sort of are making something sort of that is not a game feel more game-like. And, again, what we know is that it can increase sort of engagement in, in really... Um, you know, anything, right, in, in terms of, of um, you know, whether you're um, doing some sort of um, challenge in an app around fitness and you get a badge, um, or whether you're, um, again, getting a, a level that, that goes up. Um, and then I think we, we see that, again, in, in some studies, it's been um, 15 studies that they did this systematic review on, there was some, some slight improvement in, in sort of overall um, outcomes. Um, and the engagement did appear to lessen over time. So, again, nothing lasts forever. So people get bored of things, you know, at some point people get bored, right? Um, and so, you know, even if you, I don't know if you, I mean, you play games on your phone, but um, even sort of playing games on the phone, you know, for a while you, know, you may have played Candy Crush, and then maybe you started playing words with friends with some people, but then, like, they weren't, like, they weren't quick enough to give you their words. And so then that kind of got, you know, like, oh, I forgot about that. I'm bored with that. Then maybe you play, you know, something else on your phone. I don't know. What do you, what, you probably play a game on your phone. Oh, I'm thinking of, like, Pokemon Go. Yeah, Pokemon Go. Like, yeah, that was, like, huge. Yeah. Right. And then people were like, eh. I mean, right? Um, it, it, it's not as, you know, exciting. Um, so, you know, there is a lifespan to things. And that's okay, right? I think that's okay if we don't necessarily need them to use it forever. Um, or that there's a reason for them to maybe use it, not daily, um, but have some reason to sort of use it and, and come back, right? I wouldn't think of my, my alarm in my phone as, um, as an app, but I use it every day, and I use it differently, and I make changes to it. Like, I just changed my song to wake up to because I was, like, getting, you know, not waking up to the, um, to the other song because I was just incorporating it into my dreams. So, like, you know, I, so I use it every day, um, and I use it, like I said, but... Um, so it would be, you know, again, if I, like, if I got a reward for, like, getting out without snoozing, like, I would totally be into that. Um, you know, like, if I got money and, like, every time, you know, you don't snooze, you get more money. So I think you see the idea is that for some folks, this is something that makes it more exciting. Self-monitoring and feedback. Again, you know, pr being able to track behaviors has clearly been shown to, you know, um, uh, improve outcomes, self-reflection, um, and being able to look back. Um, and then reminders, okay? So, I, again, these are things that we know. Again, if, if folks, um, you know, push some sort of push notification, so whether it's an alarm, a reminder, um, you know, can, again, bring you back to the app um, if you have sort of, if you've forgotten. You have a busy day, you know, you may not remember to track your, your medications or your food. But if the app kind of sends you a buzz and says, hey, you forgot to do this, you know, it's a way to kind of bring you back in. I think the other thing is, again, um, the way we, we haven't done the best job of measuring effectiveness of mHealth-based interventions. <laughs> We've really looked at, if you really kind of start looking at the literature, a lot, of, a lot of it will just be based on total time used, total, you know, logins. I don't, what does that tell you? What, I mean, really, what does that tell you? If you have a multi-component intervention that is kind of free-flowing, so they can go to any different part of that app at any given time, and you know that they used it for 60 minutes, but you don't tell me, you know, where they went, what they did, what they read, who they talked to, <clears throat> did they ask a question of, you know, to, in the social group, did they um, read an article, did they do a risk assessment, right? If you're not sort of even telling me that, then, then I don't know. I can't tell you kind of what, or what the intervention means or not. Um, and so you really, as you're designing these or building off of what has already been designing, is making sure that your pair data, your app analytics basically, are capturing everything you think is important to determining the intervention effectiveness. So if you don't care, right, if you, if you say, I don't care what they do or how they do it, it's just about the fact that they use this app for four hours, then that's all you need to measure. But if you actually want to know how many articles they read and how many um, posts they make and what the content of their posts were and if they liked other people's posts or if they read other people's posts, so 
if they're a lurker. Right, so anybody, anybody like go on to like social media and like never post but read a whole lot, you? Yes, you're a lurker, right? And you may do something or think of something or go and read something, right, based on what you see, what you've read in somebody else's post, right? Um, but we, didn't, we wouldn't know that. If we weren't measuring kind of where you went, we only measured your post, we'd be like, oh, she doesn't use this. But she's probably on it more than everyone else, like scowling around, looking at people. Um, and so it may have more of an impact on her than, any, than, than the person who posted twice who we think it should have, you know, had more engagement. So, again, I think thinking about this from the beginning is really key. Um, as I said, they're sort of underdeveloped and underreported. Uh, this is just an example from a pilot study we did, um, which I'll show you more of. All right, so keys to successful implementation is engaging collaborators. Again, sometimes it's hard. Um, to kind of find all these folks, but you know, I'm not an expert in computer programming. I don't know how to program an app. Um, you know, I, I make stuff up and I say on my wish list of things that I want it to do, and they then tell me like, you're crazy, like it, it can't do that, or yeah, it could do that, but you need to pay us like you know another five hundred thousand dollars, which you know I don't have. Um, so you know, I think having folks that actually know how to do um, the the technical work. I think you know, trying to include folks that have a different viewpoint, marketing. Um, you know, the, the public, uh, uh, you know, our pub uh, private sector um, is, is something key that we haven't, you know, engaged with as well. Um, and then also, obviously, the, this is sort of, you know, the target, target population as well. And then I think, you know, as you do this, if you making these partnerships is really is important, though, to sit down ahead of time and kind of everybody get on the same page and talk in the same language. Because, again, I think we as sort of researchers um, have different um, expectations than people that are sort of fully for profit. Um, my guess, I'll ask Lisa, is you know, you get paid, you know, let's say you get paid your 10% of your salary comes from a grant, but you have to like, you know, work on that grant multiple hours that week to um, you know to fix problems or whatever, you you do it, right? You don't work on don't tell anybody that. You're not supposed to. You're not technically not supposed to. But the truth is, is like you know, and that's just, you know, again, is that, you know, we, you know, may stay up late into the night and work more than three hours that week on, even though, even though that's sort of what we're being paid for, you know, we're billing for three hours that week, but in truth, we may be working 12. It doesn't mean you're neglecting your other stuff, it just means you're adding extra hours, and I should, I'll clarify, she always works ahead of time. This is, is on the internet, by the way, so. When I say Lisa, I mean the hypothetical Lisa. Um, so I think just making sure, you know, again, because we expect if something is broken, you know, or not working quite right, we expect the developer to like, you know, fix it. And sometimes if it's a huge issue, yes. But sometimes if it's just a little tweak, they're like, gosh, this would make it so much better. And in our world, we would spend time rewriting that section of a paper, right? Or rewriting that section of a grant. They're like, no, you can give us more money. Um, build on existing platforms. Again, thinking about things that are already built. Um, if possible, again, I wouldn't give you a really bad grade on innovation if you're going to build an app, if that app was doing something different, all right? And so if you're building an app that is now sort of integrating into a crazy wearable and you are an injectable sense, you know, a sensor or ingestible sensor or you know, something that doesn't necessarily exist, even though that actually does. But, um, but if you're building something that is really innovative, um, you know, on that, for that platform, that's different. If you're going to build another app that provides tailored, you know, medication reminders and an information section and some quizzes and notifications and a social support forum, then I'm going to tell you it's not innovative because those exist. Um, and, and, and both, you know, commercially and in the, in the research world. I think stopping reinventing the wheel. The other piece, this is sort of in my bucket list of things, and we're actually starting to move, get some movement to do it, um, is content. It's the neglected, it's like the ugly stepchild of interventions um, in terms of M Health interventions. We take it for granted that development of content is, doesn't take any time, right? But you know, if you have a, an app that has a knowledge center, right, some information, and I just told you it needs to be holistic, so it's got to have information about HIV, but also maybe diet and exercise and self-esteem and depression um, and talking to providers and how to have really great hot sex, right, all of these things. It's a lot of information, right, whether it's articles, so you want that app now, right? I'm thinking that would actually be new content if it was how to have hot, great sex. You don't have, you don't talk about that? 
I have some comments. Con- well, we can talk. We'll, I'll stay after. We'll talk about it. Um, but it should be, right? I mean, again, if I ask, again, I'm not gonna, I won't take a, a, a hand poll, but if I asked you guys what, you know, you would, like, again, want to, like, in, you know, learn more about, you know, having really good sex or, um, you know, having exercise, right, or, you know, taking your, you know, going for uh, you know, a, a salad or something, right, I mean, you know, whatever, even just medication adherence, right, um, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't learn about medication adherence too, but God, wouldn't it be great to also learn about great hot sex, um, but all of these, all of this information, whether it's in, in, in videos or, or text-based, short sections, long sections, that written for sort of young black MSM, that's been tailored, some of this has been tailored for young Hispanic MSM, right? All of this content exists in all of our interventions, whether it's in-person interventions, whether it's M-Health interventions, so much of it has already been written, and we get rewrite it every time we're creating a new intervention. So we're trying to develop a content library, like a repository, basically a, an edit, a searchable uh, resource where, you know, let's say, you know, you guys want to make your new intervention. You want to develop an intervention for HIV positive or negative folks around stress, and you want to address, have HIV information in it, and whatever. You know, you could basically go into the library and type HIV, black MSM, whatever, and you would get a, a list that could then be easily exported into sort of a format to incorporate into other apps. And some way that then you could say, you would, you know, cite where that, where that information came from, and if you make changes to it, could be resubmitted so that it's either an update or an, an edit for a different population um, and can sort of have some citations of, um, you know, where the information came from that can be cited. Because again, we, we also always sort of build off of these interventions, um, and, but the content matters. The tone matters. The, the, this, it's some sort of, you know, some of this is, is how we tailor, right? It's sort of the tone and, and the way that we're providing the information. So for me, that's been sort of a bucket list of, of things. And again, this was a study that should have 10 computer-based interventions on adherence. All, there was total overlap in all the content but none of them had worked together or you, you know, shared. So I think you know, we can do a better job of that because that takes, it also takes a lot of time and a lot of manpower. So wouldn't it be nice if you got funded for a grant where you, you, know, you didn't have to spend six months and, you know, an R, of an RA's time writing content, where you could actually just spend that time thinking about recruitment and retention and doing more usability testing in an iterative and agile way. Um, and then I think, you know, it's really important to do pilot testing. You know, again, I think we, as we were, we were talking earlier is that, you know, you build, if you build something that you want people to use over time, you really have to do small trials where you test them using it over time just to make sure it works. Because sometimes we find, you know, we, we kind of, we continue to test sort of day one of the app or day two of the app. What we really need to be t- testing is day 76 of the app. So figuring out either how to do that kind of with the development company can sometimes actually fast forward things, which is good, or at least sort of having youth use it for, you know, 14 days, 20, you know, 30 days to sort of see what happens over time. <clears throat> and then consider costs from the start of implementation. So again, I don't think it's as much as important as sort of if you're building one or adapting one, but what is the cost to deliver it? So for example, in one of our studies, we have um, the ability to have an adherence counselor um, text or provide sort of counseling through the portal. And so, you know, maybe some folks need that, maybe some folks don't need that. Um, and so in our study, we'll be looking kind of at, you know, the cost of, um, of, of adding that feature on. All right, so the last section, we're doing good on time. Um, I'm just going to talk about our platform. So we call it CHARGE, so it's Comprehensive Health Adherence Using Gaming and Engagement. Um, and so again, I, I try, I'm going to try and sort of highlight how we have thought about developing this based on the things I told you we should be doing, because I don't always do what I'm supposed to do. Um, but first, we built it on a platform that's already established by a, a company that built this before us. So they built this Empower platform. The company is uh, a Yogo who are up in Vancouver. <coughs> and. Uh, very nice. And so I went to them, I read them on, like in one of these, I, I don't know, read on the, on the internet something they'd won an award for like the top health gamification company in XXX. And I, so I emailed them and said, hey, 
have you ever done work with HIV? Would you be interested in expanding into that population? And they were like, cool. Um, and so we started trying to get grants. Um, so basically, they have this platform that they then, you know, as I build in features, the features get incorporated into the platform. As other, you know, folks that are developing diabetes interventions with their platform or um, uh, diet interventions with their platform develop features, that can be in integrated into what I'm doing. So we're, it's sort of a shared space for making the platform better and adapting it. But also they're responsible, they're going to update, you know, when iOS comes out with 10.7 or I don't know where we are, 11.2, they're going to make sure that their app, the app is updated for that because they have to. This is their entire business. Whereas if, if I develop it in-house, that's it's a lot of work is to stay just on those types of things. So, um, and that's what it looks like in our in the app store, which to me was just the coolest thing to have an app in the app store. You can't get it. You could you could go there and look at this, but you couldn't download it right now. But it still is pretty cool. Um, and then we have iOS and Android theoretical basis. Like I said, theory is based on theory. Two theories for us: fog behavioral model is really around app based intervention, so motivators, triggers, things to get folks to kind of use and come back to the app and do habit building, and then social cognitive theory. So observational learning, role playing, self-efficacy, all of those things. Evidence-based, like I said, again, building off of what we know, how do we get here? We did a lot of focus groups. We've done, we always kind of relied on youth advisory boards across the entire country, um, both in person and using video conferencing. We've done in-depth interviews um, and post uh, usability pilot uh, uh, qualitative interviews with folks. So again, trying to continue to build the evidence base. Um, and again, these are the things we found, which are the same things that have been found in other studies. So again, it just confirms that I think there you know, whether you're looking at young MSM in the US or Thailand or um, in, you know, Connecticut versus, you know, North Carolina, you're seeing some things repeat. Doesn't mean that, you know, those, those folks are, are completely homogeneous. It just means that there's some features that keep repeating and should be included. All right, so here's our two apps we have currently. So AlliQuest is our art adherence intervention, and then P3, Prepared, Protected, Empowered, is our intervention for um, uh, um, uh, those on PrEP. And again, we've, we started initially with AlliQuest, so a lot of the features um, that you sort of see in that app have been sort of enhanced. And as we develop sort of the next version of AlliQuest, they'll have more of the P3 features. So it's sort of an iterative process between the two apps. Um, just privacy features, again, this came out as an, as an issue. So again, just sort of to show, we have avatars um, you know, that, we, that we use. P3 has a superhero theme. AlliQuest had more of a kind of a fun kind of uh, you know, uh, animal with glasses. I don't know if we're going to use that again. But, but if this is what, you know, what, what folks kind of liked, just sort of this weird, you know, didn't have any relation to anything that they were doing. Um, and then, you know, privacy features, so it's confidential as people download it. There's information about how to lock, um, create a pin. The app automatically times out if you, um, if you don't use it, things like that. Medication tracking and adherence, so there's a reminder system with discrete reminders, which folks said. So you basically, when you log on to the app, if you want to take it in the morning, uh, it sort of walks you through sort of the idea of, of how you would sort of decide when you would take your art or your prep, right? So kind of when, you know, what, what is something you do at the same time every day? Eat breakfast, brush my teeth, plug in my phone at night. So if you pick that strategy, it will suggest that you take it at 9 p.m. or 8 p.m., right, or 6 p.m., whatever it is sort of that you do at a certain time, and then you can kind of, will get a reminder every day. However, like, let's say um, you say, you, you know, you want to um, take, um, take your medicine every time you brush your teeth. Your reminder will say, hey, are your teeth shiny tonight? And with the toothbrush, right? So it doesn't say, did you take your medicines? What it's, it's tying, you know, your medicine taking to your toothbrushing, and so your reminder ties you back to your toothbrushing, which would then hopefully tie you back to your medicine. So, so that idea of sort of how you kind of have it build. And then other ways, when you log on and you onboard, you also kind of put in how many current medication or how many current pills you have, and then when you want a reminder to fill your, call your pharmacist. Um, and then tailored adherence strategies like we talked about, and a calendar so you can kind of self-reflect. In addition, if you report that you're not taking your medicines, um, it will provide strategies and, and suggest perhaps maybe a change in strategy. Um, so all of that. Um, and then it's back-end health, health care provider dashboard. So this is where we can do adherence counseling um, or, or send um, 
tailored messages, or we can have it programmed to send automatic messages. So again, building off of things we know work or some sort of reminder system, right? Not maybe not daily, but maybe weekly, some sort of two-way interactions that can that can happen. These are adherence, some of the adherence counseling sessions within P3. We developed a sort of a, a, a way to, to increase, uh, to uh, develop, uh, adapt what's known as next step counseling, which is sort of a motivationally enhanced based counseling to improve adherence. So that can be delivered um, through, the, through the app. Daily discussions, so again, a place for folks to have conversations to build social support without, in, you know, within ensuring that that is focused, because this is not, you know, Instagram. This is not Facebook. This is not Reddit, right? This is, this is a forum within an app that is, you know, overall still designed to, you know, for a health thing, right? So I don't expect this to be a place where people are going to, like, talk about, um, you know, their, um, you know, things that they would necessarily say in a different social, you know, a different um, a social media platform, right? They don't need to post pictures of, of their new dog or, you know, or uh, uh, what they need is sort of, is for us to sort of figure out how we can get folks to give and receive support around some of the things that are important, right? Not all necessarily HIV or art or prep, but how do we kind of focus some discussion? And so this, all, this, the way that this form starts out is with a social prompt, a daily social prompt. So, um, you know, I think in this one is, I can't read that far because I'm old. Finding the right way to get prep into your routine can help you remember to take them every day. What works for you? So again, the idea to stimulate some conversation so perhaps people can get tips um, around, around that. Um, and then again, other ways, daily quests. These are sort of way, things that almost are like sort of daily skills building activities. So, you know, basically kind of, um, you know, if, if somebody sort of identifies some issues or barriers to adherence, it's sort of something for them to do maybe sort of even outside the app. Make a list of all of the, you know, questions that you want to ask your provider at the next appointment. You know, watch this YouTube video um, that talks about this, you know. So, again, ways to sort of get folks to do things that, you know, do this mindfulness video. Right here, watch this. You know, create do this mindfulness activity um, or something like that. Anything that, that that can help build skills, and then quizzes, knowledge centers, all that good stuff. Um, again, our knowledge center again includes art, prep, safe sex, relationships, general health and wellness. So a lot of, of things that we they sort of have talked about, including videos, right, testimonials, um, uh, and then. The end of, of our knowledge center at the end, it sort of has sort of a check-in. Was this sort of information useful to you, you know, or not? Um, and then, and we sort of continue to use that to refine what information we include in the interventions. If a lot of folks did not find an, an article useful, then we don't need to keep it just because we can keep it, right? You know, we, then we should better, we should thin things out so that we actually can put in more that might be, you know, more useful. Tailored content sets, so again, we talked about tailoring. So when folks are logged onto the app, they ask, answer certain questions about, um, again, the, the first thing, so the main purpose of the app is around adherence to art or prep. So the first sort of questions will be um, sort of address, and, and, and folks that are in the study, at least uh, for now, are folks that are having trouble. So the first tailoring is sort of around that, right? So they're going to get some, some tailoring around adherence, some content set designed to sort of um, address some, some issues they're having with adherence, depending on whether it's, um, you know, related to substance use or mental health issues or um, related to kind of just not understanding why they need to take it. However, then they get these sort of check-ins monthly where we kind of, again, what if they're doing great? What if they're doing really good at month one and now they're taking all their meds all at the same time? So do they need to use the app anymore? Well, maybe, right? Maybe because what we know is that folks um, sustaining adherence, particularly among youth, is, is low, but also are there other things that we could help them address, right, that then, that might actually impact adherence down the line. So what else is important to them? Well, maybe they're doing really well at taking their meds, but they're still drinking a whole lot. And maybe for them that's important. Or maybe for them what's really important is to be able to disclose their status to their, to their mom, right, or their sex partner. So can we then sort of provide them with different content? And, and, and so sort of, again, showing that we're being um, you know, responsive to kind of things that they, they may need. Um, the the uh, gamification piece, so as folks use the app, there's sort of two things they do in terms of gamification. They either get points within the app, and that unlocks collections that are either um, 
uh, kind of choose your own adventure collections, or I'll show you kind of our other reward, or they actually get money. Um, and so they get um, uh, a behavioral economics kind of uh, approach where if they use the app or they do kind of one of the activities we deem kind of important, so they track their meds. I don't care if they track that they took them or didn't take them, but they just tracked them. They get 50 cents, all right? If they don't use the app that day, they lose a dollar. So I never go under, like nobody owes me money. Um, so we see the account. So when they start, they get, there's 30 bucks in that account. So these folks that were using it for a month, all right, for in our pilot shop, 30 bucks. So at the end of 30 days, if they don't use it at all, they ain't getting any money. However, if they use it every day, they will get 45 bucks that they didn't have before they started. So, and, and using it is really, really quick. So for some folks, that's a motivator. And maybe it's a motivator enough to get them to use the app or to enter the app such that they can have access to all the other things. The other thing that we've been doing in terms of, of, of thinking about is sort of how to bring the community into these apps and make it, um, uh, you know, combine kind of what folks are actually looking at online with what we want them to look at. And so what's been really popular, again, I'm, I'm not in, in this world, but are sort of these web series that folks develop, these sort of webisodes. Um, and so um, we're, you know, I think of it as like binging on like a Netflix show, I guess. Um, but these, these, these series are produced by, you know, by, by like local, really talented um, filmmakers that um, get, you know, a lot of folks sort of, you know, watch. And so we worked with a group in Chicago called Open TV and basically had them create a web series that is only available within our app. And the series follows basically um, these six um, mainly black and brown, queer, youth and young adults who are navigating kind of friendship and relationships. And the whole thing starts at a, starts at a, um, the first sort of web, web episode starts with them at a, a supper. They have this, they call it the, um, they sort of have these Sunday suppers. And, um, and, and you kind of figure out that there's a whole lot of drama going on. And over the, you know, prior, then the, the next episode, you kind of see what led up to that meeting. Um, and, you know, again, what we've weaved in is that it, like, within the series, one of the characters is on prep and is using P3. Um, one of the characters is positive. So, again, a way to kind of um, try and make this, again, more realistic, but also really kind of listen to, like, what folks are sort of saying that they're interested in. The cool thing for us is that this, um, our plan is for the, our, this series is called Good Enough. So the plan is that when the app after the trial is done, we'll, we'll, the film the group film group will release the full web series. You know, we'll, they can they can have they'll have access to it to release it publicly. And again, with the hope that if this works, we would commission them or others to do more stuff like this that could be in all of our apps. So it'd be kind of a cool thing that again, you'd maybe you'd want the next to use P3 again because you'd see more. So again, other ways to think about engagement, right? People watch. You know, they get hooked on series and they watch, they come back and they wait for all of them to be released. And um, so again, another thing to think about in terms of engagement that hasn't been studied. Um, so it's just, you know, we've done some pilot work. I just wanted to show you kind of how we look at um, analytics in terms of how folks use it. Um, this is looking at blogging meds. Again, the articles read, number of posts, the content of posts. Other ways to evaluate things are, are types of scales. The system usability scale is one. Although, again, it, it wasn't developed for this kind of stuff. We use it because if you don't put it in your paper, you get dinged of like, you do a formal usability of exam, you know. And if you don't put it in your grant, you get dinged for not using validated measures. But it's, you know, again, interaction with app is consistent. What the f does that mean? Like, sh why wh should it be? Like, what does consistent mean, right? I mean, one of the interventions we're doing is a virtual reality intervention where we're actually having folks talk to avatars to practice disclosure. Well, I don't want it to be consistent. I want that avatar to actually be inconsistent in the way they respond to folks who disclose to them so that my participant can learn how to disclose or if they want to disclose to like somebody who's a really nice guy or somebody who's an ignorant asshole. So, you know, I want them to be, I want it to be inconsistent. So what, you know, what am I measuring here? Um, and again, we look at sort of, again, how does the app impact HIV self-management or the outcomes we need? And so looking at those relationships is really important. So P3, we've done usability testing 
and we're in the middle of a field test um, that's at multiple sites. And then next steps, we have an R34 for AlliQuest um, that Kate Messig is uh, the PI of, and P3 is part of our adolescent trials network um, study, so we'll be doing a randomized controlled trial of that three arms. So one is control, one is just the app, and one is the app plus the counselor. In the future, again, my goal is to create a sort of a comprehensive app. And so we're trying to sort of, you know, there's, you know, the, the, the tailoring could just sort of descend to sort of, you know, which features or content you might need, but the, but the, but the overall components are the same. So building one more comprehensive app, um, including other lifestyle issues like other prevention issues, testing reminders, um, as well as health-related stuff. So tracking of drug use, tracking of smoking, right? The medication tracker is, is built. You, you enter some information about something you do every day. Why could you not, you know, therefore not make that number of cigarettes you smoke every day, number of drinks you have every day, your mood every day, right? It's a tracker. So let's, you know, why, you know what, what if folks want to track more than one thing? Um, considering, you know, again, continuing to consider how we're going to make this work large scale. Um, and then we also have some small funding to take it global. So again, uptake of M Health is, is really um, not limited to the U.S. We have a, a small grant uh, to, to adapt the app for MSM in Thailand. And then we've done some pilot testing with youth in South Africa and are trying to get some additional funding to do that. So usability, affordability, scalability, sustainability, large scale accessibility, all of these things, I think, are what we need to be thinking about in the future um, and, and certainly not recreating and, and, and um, you know, spending so much time doing what already has been done that we don't ever get to what I think are, are where is the real opportunity with M Health. So I think looking at evidence to date, even if it's not just about HIV, I think we can learn a lot from other fields, other um, disciplines, cancer, diabetes, um, uh, obesity. All, you know, folks are doing this in all different, different realms, and we need to have better crosstalk and think about things more collaboratively um, and then um, kind of move the field forward. So thank you. She was right. I have two minutes for questions, but I can, I can, I can talk. I can stay after, too. I think we have to leave the room, but I'm happy to move to another room, too. So thank you. Thank you. So you're working mostly with young people. Yes. Um, are you finding, what are you finding in terms of the sort of mainstream social media that they're using? I mean, I think younger people, maybe they're moving away from Facebook. They are. You know, what are you, what are you seeing? Is it Instagram? Is it Snapchat? Yes. Are new things? What new yeah, things? so mainly Instagram and Snapchat is what we see most. Um, you know, for younger, younger, we see um, uh, other things like um, that are more, um, like there's like TikTok, which is an app where you can make little videos and like you know um, kind of karaoke, like lip sync things. Um, Reddit um, is one we see a lot of sort of folks use. Um, YouTube, um, and then there's comments within YouTube that people kind of have discussions on. So I think people use social media for more. When we think of like social media, I think we think Facebook, right? We think of a network of folks who um, you know that we may know, and then we have friends of friends, and that we like you know, can learn about what's happening in their lives. I think for youth, like the term social media is, it's like, it's a, it's a different thing. Like they're, they're constantly on the internet doing things that have a social flair, but are very different. So like my son, who's 11, um, again, clearly I have no boundaries on, on have use, but he, he sits and watches YouTube videos of other people playing video games. Right, and like, and he feels like he knows these YouTubers. Like, he, oh, Dan TDM, he's the best, right? And so then, and he like they make comments and they like talk to him on like you know what they right think. Um, again, it's through my account; it's protected. But um, so, and they, and that is you know, so that, to that that's an act, like that's a social activity in some way, right? It's very different though than posting um, something on Instagram, um, you know, or posting us, you know, a something on Snapchat that then also goes away, right? Or Twitter, right? I mean, we, again, we've seen, you know, very different ways Twitter is, is used over the last few years, right? Um, and so I think when we think about kind of what folks are on, we have to just be a, a little bit more nuanced moving forward in thinking about not only what they're on, but why they're on each of the different channels. 
Um, and certainly for, um, you know, th there's, there's certain places where folks are going just to meet partners, whether it's romantic partners or sex partners, right? Um, there's certain places where folks are going to kind of be entertained, and they are, there's overlap, right? Um, and then there's certain places where, you know, people actually um, are going to, like, let out some, inf you know, provide information and, and, and post. And, um, and then also the, the, the challenging thing is that it does change over time. Um, and so, you know, trying to be aware, and, and new things come and go, um, and you know, there's always new sites, um, and there's geographic differences, so again, even just um, uh, geospatial sexual hookup apps, like, we never see folks on Scruff in North Carolina, but like, I think out west, you know, folks are, my, I was just at a meeting in San Diego with some friends, and, and they, um, some colleagues, and they basically um, see a lot of, of Scruff. We just don't, right? Um, so, it's hard. <laughs> Having youth tell you is probably the only, the, the, the best thing. Um, a variety of youth, multiple times, you know, we, we've started to think about how, you know, we have, we've done a lot with youth advisory boards, we've done a lot, like, but that, it, they, they, they tend to be, even if they're more than, even if they're recurrent, they tend to be kind of spread out and like very structured in some way. You know, what we've started thinking about is like, how, you know, can we have sort of a cadre of youth consultants that we literally just send, you know, that we pay as consultants and sort of, you know, at, at will can just sort of send out a five minute survey that says, today, what are the top internet sites for you? And again, it's not, it's not going to be evidence based and that we're going to do a sample of a thousand people, but wouldn't that be useful, you know, to be like, you know, today, what, you know, what did you spend X, Y, and Z on? Or, like, what are the hot topics on X, Y, and Z social media? Or, you know. You have a question? Fabulous. <laughs> um, okay, so, I'm thinking about my <coughs> Selfish. I know. Fine. Um, and so, I'm thinking, like, there's, like, a lot of applications. And then you, like, put the slide up about, um, Using this with like routine and shady testing, and that's like, like dang, I'm yeah. trying to develop a model. Of Basically, trying to steal your work is what you're telling me. <laughs> I probably won't be invited back, or if I am, she doesn't want me to accept. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, oh, yeah, like that's what I want to do. And I was thinking, like, oh, yeah, I'm like, I like the idea of like, you know, really like thinking through the contents, what I say. And I was like, probably every other meeting, I'm like, remember, this is a stigma focused intervention. Sure, I know you want to talk about social support or whatever, but that's not the novel piece. The novel piece would be talking about stigma. Not that we use that word. But um, so I'm wondering your thoughts on um, how do you like keep it hot and fresh and like, are you said you. In, in like, work? <laughs> You're probably, okay. Just, just double checking. I've been asked a lot of questions. Uh, Traveling, um, coming back. Oh um, no! Um, like how do you keep people like for a routine? Like if you're trying to get someone to test every three to six months, and you talked about this, it's like the apps change. Like how do you right. get people coming back? I mean, I get like the alarm is like a necessity. How do you keep people, especially if you incorporate the gaming, the gamification of the apps, like, um, and you want people to engage in that? How do you keep right. somebody into an app for? Like at some at event a period of time. Every three years. Yeah, I think it's harder, right? Because again, so the point the point being is that you want the event to occur every three months. Okay. Right. So, however, there may be other things that actually make it yeah. more useful for them to not test on your schedule, right? right? Like, you know, what if they're you know have some you know um, discomfort when they're urinating? You want them to test right then, right? So you know, maybe incorporate some way to sort of report STI symptoms, right? Maybe they want like some really good condom and lube and they want to order that through the app. Um, maybe they want a way to keep track of, of folks that, um, that they're having sex with or places um, where they, um, you know, people that they meet online that, um, you know, they want to kind of meet again, maybe, right? And these are all different things that people might, you know, right, might. So all these things relate. To, um, to it, maybe um, you know, they want to um, be able to order a home test. Sometimes, not always, yeah, right? But we do video conferencing yeah. with our participants. Yeah, so to I'm teach them to. Like maybe, there would be, maybe there could be like a video conferencing component, like if they yeah. want to talk to somebody. Yeah, maybe they want to talk to somebody. Maybe they just have a question. Maybe they want to show you a picture of their rash, right? Um, you know, maybe, again, like, I think that's the question is sort of, okay, you want them to do this. It, it, HIV testing, everything, that, that is, that you could just send them a text message. Yeah. What, I mean, if you just are trying to remind them to do a discrete activity at a certain time point, 
that's, that can be a text message. Um, right. If you're trying to also do other things, or to you know, or to keep them in, you know engaged, to then kind of not only kind of remember to do that activity, but be motivated to want to do that activity, then you could build a comprehensive app around it, right? And so you have some way that they get points for doing healthy activities, right? Points for um, you know. Uh, reporting if they've you know had some sex, um, whether or not it was good or bad, right? Points for you know, reporting whether they didn't have sex. Points of whether they, again something you know again points for providing information, right? Whether whatever the information is, because we're not going to judge it, right? Points for either ordering condoms or you know sending a picture of the condom they you know or writing a condom review, right? Writing a review of lube, writing a review of some other thing, right? And then at the end of the time, they can record, they can turn those points into some sort of Incentive, but you have to take the test to get it. What about doing it from the other way? So, like, it sounds like the um, like you got, you kind of started off here with talking about like first with friends and candy crush and how mm -hmm. you like how you go through phases where like an app is super hot now, mm -hmm. and they found another. I think I'm super yeah. Hot. But like to me, when I think of apps that I, I'm not enough researcher, but when I think of apps I like, it's the same thing drawing me to it, but repackaged first. Yes. And so I'm like, is that like, is that like an approach you can take too with things like parents? It's like you're getting, you're giving the same thing to somebody, but it's totally, it's like newly new skinned, yeah. newly skinned, yeah. right? So maybe that's a feature, right? Totally, you know, they allow them to change their skin. One of the things we, so we, we've been sort of what I wanted you know to do with this is that I feel like like P3 is that superhero bend. So like the next skin that I want to make that like people could flip back for through. Is like um, you know all the superheroes have their real personalities, you know like Clark Kent and Superman, right? Um, and so you know having kind of one side be kind of the normal person and the other side be the superhero. So you could you know again kind of flip back and forth between kind of the real and the and the superhero um, as a way to kind of change it up a bit. It's slightly different, right? But it's the same. The other yes, and then the other thing is to have it on a platform that does continue to have. Advances. So, why do we continue to buy? Why do we buy new iPhones? Right. Who has an iPhone 10? You. You do. Um, why did you? What did you have before that? Be honest. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Apologies. 10s. And and what was the phone you had before that? A 10. So you upgraded from a 10 to 10x. Why? Apple told you you should. And is it better? Maybe. Maybe. What's the like? What's the main difference you've noticed? Screen size. The screen is a little bigger. Yeah. Okay, fine. So that's you know again what you're saying is that you spent let's just say a thousand dollars, eight hundred. Yeah. Wow. I hope you pay him well. If not, yeah. Um, so you spent that much money because Apple told you to to buy something. I'm not trying to make you. I I, I would buy it too if I had the money and my wife let me, but she doesn't. Um, but you know, so we're, the feature there's not a whole lot of difference, but you think there's a difference because somebody told you there's a difference. Why don't we do that? Why does it have to be so different? Right? Why can't it be an enhanced version? Sometimes I think that people just have me update things, or it shows me because it makes me feel like they're doing something with it. I don't think they're doing a damn thing. I didn't notice a difference. But it's like, oh, we're updated. We have new features, bug fixes. Really? You know? Right? So I think, you know, that maybe that's sort of, you know, have Apple tell them to do it. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah, so I wanted to go back to what you were, you mentioned Agile. Yes. Um, so. Okay, so that, I have two ways of thinking about that, and I'm interested to hear how it um, manifests in the grant proposal, because it's very interesting. So, um, as a community health worker, right, Agile means to me that kind of regardless of how the grant is written, you know, <laughs> what data I have to collect, what reports I have to submit, mm -hmm. if I know my client needs X, Y, Z beyond that, I'm going to do whatever it is. Because I know without it, they will not succeed right. in the areas right that are important to the grant. So agile to me is being profoundly flexible based on the mm -hmm. needs of the client. Agile in a business sense, and I also come from a business background, obviously means something completely different um, around the development of 
products, mm -hmm. the way in which teams meet, the way in which they build in short sprints, yep. the way in which we're highly successful, right? Low cost, high return. We get to test it if it works. We build on right. what we know. And neither one of these things that I'm describing represent any research grant proposal I could ever imagine. Like there's no format within which they ask for either one of these right. kinds of things. Um, but we know that it's used all the time now in for-profit health systems and health services. Um, so we, we have this gap. And so I'm just wondering, you, you are really promoting that, and I understand why. One, because it's a life or death issue, and two, because it makes the research knowledge more effective. Mm -hmm. But how does it, how do you, how does that come across in a grant proposal? How are you writing that? Are you Kind of hiding yes. that, or you just some. Like, we're learning yeah. process evaluation, or what does it look like? I mean, some of it is a little bit of hiding, right? Knowing that, like knowing at some point what you can and can't do within the boundaries of a grant, and, and some of it is so, some of it is sort of this buzzword idea, right? right? But I think what we're learning more and more is how to think about this up front with the companies and, the, and you know, that we're working with, as Not well as as well as the way we're doing like even sort of user, getting user input. Mm -hmm. So even sort of the piece that I sort of mentioned around kind of thinking about youth as consultants uh, yes. versus a YAB. Mm -hmm. So typical um, yes. you know, grants we've written is that we would have a YAB and the YAB would meet monthly yeah, and yeah, they would yeah. review the look and feel and the appearance and the content yeah, yeah. of the intervention and then we would make adaptations based on that. Again, if they meet monthly and then you get that at feedback and then you transfer that feedback to your company and that like, Right? So instead, having youth consultants where you sort of have a, a question. Do you like this? Yeah. What does this say to you? Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be all of the content. But like, look at this article. How does this look? You know, we wrote an article where we um, talked about like um, STDs by, and we sort of like used a lot of emojis and eggplants and peaches and all that, right? And, you know, <laughs> stuff, right? And, um, and so we wanted to see like, is it really corny? Like, is this a stupid idea? Um, so instead of like writing the entire thing, we wrote something about you know crabs or whatever with all of it, and we sent it you know out as a survey. Do you like this, or what do you like that discrete choice experiments? Different ways of asking questions. Do you like this or this? All right. Do you like this or this? Do you like this or that? Right. And then putting those together, so they actually are forced to kind of you know again focus groups. I'm not downing them, but like you you do a focus group with an app, and they're going to some you know and let's say there's six people. You know, all six are going to tell you they want a different color. All six are going to tell you they want a different avatar. Um, you know, six or, or three are going to tell you that they really think the avatar should have all of these features that can make it different and change. You know, um, you know, two are going to tell. So, you know, the other piece is sort of knowing if you're going to do a focus group, what are you willing to change within your app? Don't ask about the color of your app if you're not willing to create seven colors. Don't ask about X, Y, or Z. Ask about exactly what you're willing and your company is willing to change. And then get that information to the company. Like, I think that's the other piece, is how I'm trying to yeah, make it work. Does that make sense? Yes, it, yes, it does. Awesome. Oh, my friend with the iPhone and the unlimited money. <laughs> Go ahead. I was just curious. I mean, the app seems like a great way to engage someone once they're in the study and I was just curious how you engage people to even entertain the idea of using the app. Yeah. Like, how do you explain it to them? How do you encourage them? Is it just money or is it, you know, other yeah, I mean, we do the recruitment. I think probably is similar the, the way you know you all are doing it is depending if it's an if it's a fully online recruitment. We obviously use on, online mechanisms. If it, um, we we also work with a bunch of sites. And so within those sites, um, we work with a lot of um, adolescent uh, 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 treatment providers in different cities. And so within that, those groups, we ensure that they have community collaborators and we work with them in terms of word of mouth, right? So it's just a straight recruitment into the study, I would say. So they can't see the app before they can't. The study. Not the way, not currently, because we're currently, again, I think, having doing efficacy studies. My hope, again, in my, like, you know, in my dreams, when they're not, you know, about really hot sex, but in my, my work dreams, um, I separate the two, um, you know, it would be to be able to have a super app that we just put up and we see what happens, right? And we make it available for, you know, a certain period of time 
and then we, you know, make it not available, and we kind of go to the people and sort of say, you know, whatever. We, you know, we make it available, and we, then we evaluate them, and, and we sort of see, you know, what folks do with it. What do they use it for? Um, you know, the problem is, is that, you know, developing an app is one thing, and it, it does require maintenance, so licensing fees and kind of continued upkeep, right? So how do you make it sustainable? You know, if your grant ends in five years and you find that it's great, or even sort of maybe partially good. Like, it, why does it have to be perfect? If it's just, you know, if it's, it, if it's an app that you could put on the app store and it would work for a certain percentage of people, you could reach so many more people than an in, in-person intervention. So small effects can really actually have large impact if you have the ability to do that. So um, that's sort of my hope is sort of, and then to have sort of, you know, again, I would love to have a comprehensive, like a dashboard of apps. Right, so this one maybe really is focused on on you know a, a, adherence and and kind of you know in terms of HIV and, and we're adding more health conditions. But but let's say um, you know this wasn't the one they liked, right? So maybe a way to kind of make things fresh is to have you know a compendium of like okay, you know these are all kind of apps that we know work. They're kind of part of our suite. Try one. If that doesn't work, try the other one. Go back to that one. Maybe maybe binding them both works. Right? I mean, like that's sort of the piece that I think is also missing. Is like, how do we like again? If you you know, if you wanted like diet, you could do My Fitness Pal, and then or you could do the Weight Watchers app, right? And you might go back and forth between the two because you know maybe one has an update that you really like, a certain tiny little feature, but that feature is important that you can scan the barcode of your food. And it has more foods in the, in that you know to record your calories. So you want to use that one. But the other one it tracks your fitness and in integrates into your smartphone better. So you want to use them both. Or and then but then the other one gets those features. So you want to go. So again, I think just in the real world, there's so much more choice. Um, and so we I just you know not that I know how to do this. So this is like again all of the things that I would like to do. Um, is you know is to be able to give folks that choice and and evaluate it um, and but not have to be so constrained by um, you know my app is better than your app and you know we have to be separate. Thank you.